Welcome to Assessing Christian Nationalism uh, with uh, lessons from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, my name is Travis Pical, and I'm the Associate Director at Anselm House, which is a Center for Christian Study at the University of Minnesota. Um, we've been having a ongoing conversation uh, with students at the university, um, particularly in the, the law school on faith law and public policy uh, that this conversation sort of comes out of. Um, we're really grateful for those of you who are a part of that ongoing group and for those of you who are who are coming on um, just for today's event. So um, our topic is one that's uh, I think very important and one that we're grateful for the opportunity to, to sort of wrestle with. Um, but before we introduce our speaker, I'm going to just say a word to generally about how things are going to go. I'll I'll introduce my colleague Kyle Hamilton in a moment, who will introduce Dean Vischer. Um, and uh, and then after Dean Vischer offers his initial remarks, Kyle will uh, lead a time of question and answer. Uh, so along the way, if you have questions for the Q&A period, I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and put those in the chat function. Um, and I will, uh, sort of log them and put them in a place where it's easy for Kyle to see them and to um, to bring them into the Q&A. But also, if you'd prefer, you can, um, during the Q&A function, just go ahead and raise your hand in the reactions uh, area. And that'll indicate that you would like to ask a question out loud and Kyle will have the opportunity to call on you to ask a brief question. And as always with Anselm House, our question in um, Q&A policy is that we ask that you ask uh, questions that are short, respectful, and in the form of a question. So make sure your questions are actually questions and um, everything will go, go well. So uh, without further ado, let me invite Kyle uh, Hamilton, who is our uh, student program associate and who leads our faith law and public policy conversation group to uh, get us get things kicked off. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Travis. Good afternoon. Good to be with you all. Uh, thanks for joining us for this conversation. And uh, before I introduce Dean Vischer, I just would like to acknowledge and again say thank you to the Christian Legal Society and St. Thomas More Society for your ongoing partnership and for co-sponsoring this event and conversation. Um, it's just yeah, it's a it's a privilege to to host this event with you, and especially for this Law and Religion Week um, at at the U. And so we're just really grateful for this partnership and excited to have Dean Vischer. So um, Dean Vischer serves both as dean and the Mengler Chair in Law at the University of Saint Thomas School of Law. His scholarship explores the intersection of law, religion, and public policy, with a particular focus on the religious and moral dimensions of professional identity. His recent uh, works include Martin Luther King Jr. and the Morality of Legal Practice, Lessons in Love and Justice, published by Cambridge University Press in 2013, and, Conscious and, and Conscience and the Common Good, Reclaiming the Space Between Person and the State, also published by Cambridge, in 2010. Uh, today we get to hear from Dean Vischer talk about assessing Christian nationalism lessons from Martin Luther King Jr. So uh, I'm now going to invite you all to help me welcome, <laughs> virtually welcome Dean Vischer to, to this event. Uh, thank you. I, I, I sense the welcome. Uh, uh, it's great to to gather, and this is I view this as sort of a workshop because these are ideas that I'm still working through. I haven't I have not talked about uh, these ideas before, trying to connect King to Christian nationalism, and so I, I really do welcome your feedback. I'm going to talk for 20 minutes or so, and and so hopefully have plenty of time for questions, comments, um, because I think this is a really important. Uh, subject, whether or not I do it justice or not, we'll see. But, uh, you know, one sort of my starting point is, is one unfortunate aspect of the American culture war that we're in is the tendency to weaponize words in ways that stretch beyond any semblance of their original meanings. So terms such as woke or PC or cancel culture 
they're now deployed to signal that something is bad without shedding meaningful light on the reasons why it's bad. And I'm, I have some concern that Christian nationalism is going to meet the same fate. Uh, since the attack on the US Capitol in January, it's showing signs of becoming an all encompassing, all purpose condemnation of any effort to integrate Christian beliefs with civic engagement. Um, and uh, so we need to talk about what it is and what it is not. I also want to address head on any perception that I intend to be partisan in my portrayal of healthy Christian political engagement or in my criticism of unhealthy Christian political engagement. There's plenty on the left and the right sides of the political spectrum for a Christian to criticize and reasonable Christians can disagree in good faith on the particulars. There's no equivalent to Christian nationalism on the left, though, and it's much less likely that influential, politically nefarious movements on the left will make Christian faith so central to their identity and mission. So what is Christian nationalism? Well, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry recently published a, a great book, Taking America Back for God, and it's very data intensive, uh, exploring Christian nationalism. They describe Christian nationalism as a cultural framework that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic life, and that it blurs distinctions between Christian identity and American identity viewing the two as closely related and seeking to enhance and preserve their union. It's really this union of Christian and American identity. So if America was founded by God for a unique purpose, then the Constitution was divinely inspired. And displaying the American flag in church sanctuaries is not a blurring of American and Christian identities, but a natural marker of the faith. And why is Christian nationalism so dangerous? Put simply, when we merge our religious identity with our political identity, we will do anything to ensure that our political tribe prevails. We're no longer debating ideas about which reasonable people can disagree. We are defending Christianity against its enemies. It's why noted evangelical author Eric Metaxas said, in reference to his claims of a stolen election, that it's, quote, God's will for America to keep spreading liberty around the world. And so, quote, who cares what I can prove in the court? So regardless of what the courts say about election fraud, quote, we need to fight to the death to the last drop of blood because it's worth it, right? That's where Christian nationalism can lead. When a particular political outcome becomes a tenet of my Christian faith, there's nothing left to argue about. And when there's nothing left to argue about, that's a very dangerous place for democracy to find itself. So there's danger to the democracy, but there's also danger to our public witness as Christians. Among the many heartbreaking images emerging from the attack on the US Capitol were the Jesus Saves banners being held by rioters entering the Capitol right alongside the Confederate flags, nooses, and Holocaust sweatshirts. This followed weeks of Jericho marches, prayer meetings, and rallies premised on the idea that God ordained Donald Trump to serve eight years as president and that those who stood in the way were attempting to thwart God's will. We have to be able to respond to this in a way that, that incorporates the faith dimension of this struggle. We have to ground our response in an authentic Christian understanding of the world. So I'm gonna talk, um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about conspiracy theories, but I just need to acknowledge this in passing. We have to note that the dangers of Christian nationalism are magnified because of its very tenuous connection with reality. Christians are not called to escape to a fantasy of the world as we wish it would be. We are called to engage and minister the world as it is. That requires us to invest time and effort in understanding reality not a tribal narrative presented in YouTube videos and anonymous internet messages. The fact that Christians have a leading role in QAnon and other outrageous conspiracy theory movements, and that those are central to Christian nationalist movements, are scandalous departures from the dictates of our faith. Now, as a matter of demographics, Christian nationalists are in decline. 
They're likely to have outsized influence for some time to come, though, because their support of Christian nationalism is intense, especially as they continue to see themselves as a persecuted minority. But they're not a tiny minority at all. As Whitehead and Perry report, in 2017, 29% of Americans agreed that the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation, and 46% agreed that the federal government should advocate Christian values. As of 2013, nearly two-thirds of Americans agreed that God has granted America a special role in human history. So what is Christian nationalism not? First, Christian nationalism is not really religious in its aim or its purpose. The call of Christian nationalists to take America back for God is not primarily about mobilizing the faithful toward religious ends. It's about reclaiming power in the public sphere. Second, Christian nationalism is not Christian patriotism. Love of country is the healthy aspect of being human, a reflection that the particularity of place matters to our identity and our values. Patriotism becomes unhealthy when we reimagine our national identity as an expression of divine will, elevating our nation above others on some sort of God-ordained hierarchy. Third, Christian nationalism is distinct from Christian belief and practice. And this becomes apparent when we recognize that the two have countervailing effects. For example, and this is back to the Perry and Whitehead book, which is just chock full of great examples like this. The more Americans adhere to Christian nationalist views, the less willing they are to acknowledge police discrimination against black Americans. But when you control for the other variables, the more frequently people attend church, pray, or read the Bible, the more likely they are to recognize racial discrimination in policing. The same patterns hold true in terms of attitudes toward immigrants, the environment, gun control, Muslims, and other hot button issues. We can't equate Christian nationalism with American Christianity. As Philip Gorski puts it, Christian nationalism is political idolatry dressed up as religious orthodoxy. All right, so how should we respond? Well, we need to articulate, and more importantly, we need to model healthy Christian political engagement. And I take three characteristics from the ministry of Martin Luther King Jr. I think these are key. First, Christian political engagement does not invoke faith as a conversation stopper. It's not a conversation stopper. For King, religion was the entry point to a broader moral conversation. And on both sides of the political spectrum, the most effective advocates convey the public relevance of Christian values in terms that are wide open to rational disagreement. My favorite line from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural, which was delivered near the end of, of the brutal and bloody Civil War, was his observation that both sides quote, read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each of invokes his aid against the other. It was a simple recognition of our shared humanity and shared faith, even at a time when we were killing each other in a conflict over the deeply immoral practice of slavery. Lincoln did not accuse those fighting for the Confederacy of not being real Christians. He did not claim that God had personally assured him that the Union's cause was just. And he did not assert that God's plan for civilization hinged on the outcome of the conflict. Instead, he recognized that those on the other side were just as sincere in their faith as he was. Did that humility weaken his resolve to win the war and end slavery? No. Did his empathy for those supporting the Confederacy lead him to look the other way and ignore their support of a deeply unjust institution? No. Humility and empathy shaped the way he engaged his opponents not his commitment to the moral claims underlying the conflict. The answer today is not, as some insist, to exclude commitments grounded in faith from our political discourse. The answer is to articulate the public relevance of our faith commitments in terms that reflect humility and empathy. Dr. King's faith was inseparable from his public witness. Faith was not out of bounds for him. But his faith was not invoked to shut down dissent or signal an us versus them worldview. 
His opposition to segregation was grounded in his belief that a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. However, he went on to explain that an unjust law is a code that a majority insists on a minority that is not binding on itself. So King did not ask his listeners to embrace the religious foundations of his truth telling, though many did. He asked them to embrace the resulting moral claims, regardless of how one arrived at them. He brought his faith into the public square without embarrassment, but it was the beginning of the conversation, not the end of it. By contrast, as Perry and White had described, quote, because the embrace of Christian nationalism fuses national and religious symbols and identities, it is able to legitimate its desires for the country in the will of the Christian God, bringing the transcendent to bear on everyday realities. This inhibits any chance at compromise. There is no room for disagreement. For example, Robert Jeffries, the megachurch pastor and a member of President Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board, preached a sermon in which he concluded, quote, we say without hesitation or apology that America was founded as a Christian nation and our future success depends on our country being faithful to those eternal truths of God's word. By labeling policy preferences as eternal truths, the debate is over. All right, the second characteristic of healthy Christian political engagement. Faith is not used as a signal of self-righteousness or to justify the role of blameless victim. Dr. King did not speak in terms of victimhood. He shared powerful stories of injustice without exaggerating or wallowing in his own suffering. After years of conservatives mocking liberals for playing the victim, President Trump embraced the label wholeheartedly on behalf of his supporters. At one post-election rally, the president proclaimed in conjunction with alleged election fraud, quote, we're all victims. Everybody here, all these thousands of people here tonight, they're all victims, every one of you. Surveys show that a majority of white evangelicals believe that Christians face discrimination in the United States and are more likely to face discrimination than Muslims. <clears throat> Victimhood and blame are a strategy of self-comfort, of abdicating any responsibility for change or growth. Consider, by contrast, Dr. King's practice of Christian love, which did not always make even his own followers comfortable. He challenged his followers to overcome their fears and refused the easy path of telling them that what they wanted to hear. Even within the black community of his own city, Dr. King showed that love is not passive. It pushes, it stretches. Dr. King worked to motivate the community to organize and persist in the Montgomery bus boycott. And he encountered significant resistance to his efforts initially from within his own community. In loving others, friend or foe, black or white, he did the work that allowed him to see the world through others' eyes, but he insisted that they expand their view to encompass a truer, less isolated vision of their own well-being. He did not tell people what they wanted to hear. He did not prioritize his own popularity. Everyone who listened to him was called to lean into the effort in their own ways. These lessons about King, I'll just say as an aside, may be receding from our view because we are gradually constructing a tamer, less offensive vision of Dr. King. Since his assassination, he has gradually become almost universally admired in American society as a model of courage and dignity. Not coincidentally, he is now seen as much less threatening and disruptive to the status quo than as he was in reality. We tend to focus on the Dr. King of 1964 rather than the Dr. King of 1966. What do I mean? Well, from August 64 to August 66, Gallup surveys showed that the percentage of Americans who viewed King unfavorably jumped from 38% to 63%. In the years leading up to 1964, King had led the Montgomery bus boycott, spoken at the funerals of the girls killed in the Birmingham uh, church bombing, written his letter from a Birmingham jail, brought worldwide attention to Bull Connor's regime attacking peaceful protesters with police dogs and fire hoses, and given his I have a dream speech in which he envisioned a day when his children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And he called out in particular <clears throat> the states of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. 
So what happened during the ensuing two years? Well, King publicly opposed the Vietnam War for the first time, which could explain part of the shift in public opinion. I think the bigger issue though, was that King shifted his gaze to Northern cities. He moved to Chicago and launched his first civil rights campaign outside the deep South. I grew up hearing quite a bit about the civil rights struggle in Selma, Birmingham and Montgomery, but I grew up just outside Chicago and I was an adult before I learned about the marches he led there. The city where he encountered what he described as the most hostile crowds of his life. Rather than target a Southern society that advertised its segregation policies for all to see, he now protested deeply embedded real estate practices such as steering and redlining that kept blacks located in nor locked in Northern ghettos. In 1965, he predicted, if we can break the system in Chicago, it can be broken any place in the country. Well, he didn't break the system and we still haven't broken the system. <clears throat> it's easier to like King when he helps me feel morally righteous, when he helps me feel confident in my place on the right side of history. I would never refuse service to someone based on the color of their skin. I would never turn the dogs loose on peaceful protesters. Dr. King though, doesn't stop there. He goes on to ask me what I'm doing about the inequality in my own community. He doesn't let us comfort ourselves by pointing our fingers at the evil white Southerners. Dr. King's rejection of self-righteousness was grounded in Christian realism and was shaped in part by the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, whose work aimed at recapturing the reality and relevance of original sin. Niebuhr lamented modern society's failure to recognize that no matter how impressive its achievements, Quote, there is no level of human moral or social achievement in which there is not some corruption or inordinate self-love. <clears throat> According to Niebuhr, we all have a darkly unconscious sense of our insignificance in the total scheme of things, and we are perpetually striving to compensate for that insignificance. As King described it, Niebuhr made him aware of the complexity of human motives and the reality of sin on every level of man's existence. If we refuse to recognize the possibility that our own political tribe is capable of evil, we are denying the reality of sin. If our initial response to news of the takeover of the US Capitol was to conclude, well, Antifa must have dressed up as Trump supporters and infiltrated the protest. We've lost sight of what the Bible teaches us about human nature. This was not a problem that just emerged out of the blue in January. When Donald Trump observed at a campaign stop in 2016 that, quote, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. He was tapping into a human tendency seen clearly by Niebuhr and King the willingness to overlook our own tribe's evil because we seek to maintain our significance. Of course, the pitfalls warned about by Niebuhr and King apply to liberals and conservatives alike. Indeed, King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, not to conservatives. He was writing to liberal pastors. Those pastors supported many of the goals of King's movement, but they had urged King to be patient, to stop being disruptive, and to give white residents time to embrace the movement's goals gradually over time. King called out the liberals for being unwilling to recognize reality, that white people would not change the deeply unjust system without disruption. Sin is a human issue, not a partisan one. When Christians avoid speaking out about this for fear that they'll be accused of partisanship, we are forsaking a noble tradition of speaking truth to power. Third and finally, healthy Christian political engagement is not rooted in fear or demonization of the other. Is faith being invoked in ways that foster hatred of our opponents? Dr. King preached and practiced love for his enemies. Loving the white man, according to King, was in part a response to the white man's needs, for the white man's personhood was greatly distorted by segregation and, quote, his soul greatly scarred. Dr. King's advocacy was always a call to restore the relationships that were only possible when Black Americans and white Americans stood equal before the law. His invocation of faith made clear that even white segregationists were worthy of the beloved community. 
Dr. King protested against the perpetrators of injustice to be sure, <clears throat> but his goal was not power to be wielded against the other. His goal was the restoration of relationships broken by segregation, the building of what he called the beloved community. By contrast, consider the Christian nationalist Jericho March at which organizers warned that, quote, globalists, socialists, and communists are set to destroy our beautiful nation by sidestepping our laws and suppressing the will of the American people through their fraudulent and illegal activities in the election. Several of the Jericho March speakers called for the president's political enemies to be jailed. Perry and Whitehead show that, quote, the percentage of Americans who affirm negative stereotypes about immigrants correlates with how important they think being a Christian is to being truly American, right? Let me say that again. The percentage of Americans who affirm negative stereotypes about immigrants, that is immigrants are criminal, immigrants uh, undermine American culture, uh, factors like that, it correlates directly with how important they think being a Christian is to being truly American. Further, this is to quote Perry and Whitehead, being a Christian becomes a more important marker of national belonging, or as being a Christian becomes a more important marker of national belonging, the likelihood increases that adults feel that true Americans are those who are born here, lived here their whole lives, and are able to speak English and have American ancestry. Or look again to the sermons of Robert Jeffries, who recounted how, quote, secular Supreme Court justices in, 19, in the 1960s had removed prayer and Bible reading from public schools. So Pastor Jeffries concluded, what has happened is that we've allowed the secularists, the humanists, the atheists, the infidels to, prefer, to pervert our constitution into something our founding fathers never intended. And it is time for Americans to stand up and say, enough, we're not going to allow this in our Christian country anymore. Dr. King took a different path. He relied on agape to convey the type of love Americans needed to overcome racial injustice. In his words, agape means understanding, redeeming goodwill for all men and overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Agape is the love of God working in the lives of men. And thus, when we love on the agape level, we love men not because we like them, not because their attitudes and ways appeal to us, but because God loves them. The key for King was that agape is a love in which the individual seeks not his own good, but the good of his neighbor and does not discriminate between worthy and unworthy people or based on any qualities people possess. The importance of these demands for the civil rights movement is obvious and King made it explicit, asserting that quote, the best way to assure oneself that love is disinterested is to have love for the enemy neighbor from whom you expect no good in return, but only hostility and persecution. I'll end with one more quote from Dr. King, as I think it best captures the core shortcoming of Christian nationalism. <clears throat> as King explained, quote, agape is love seeking to preserve and create community. It is insistence on community even when one seeks to break it. Agape is a willingness to go to any length to restore community. So thanks, I'm happy to take questions, uh, visceral reactions, feedback, any, any input you have. Well, thank you so much, Dean Visser. That was a really um, stimulating, interesting set of remarks, opening remarks. Thank you so much for the time and effort you put into those. Um, to kind of kick things off with, uh, I'll start with one question and then open it up to, for others to just ask as well. You, you talked about kind of, um, you know, th this didn't, this, the, the current, the recent event with the Capitol, attack on the Capitol, that did not emerge out of nowhere. And Christian nationalism has been around for some time. I'm curious to hear a little bit about from your perspective, kind of what are the some of the, and you talked about this a little bit, but just to, to put a finer point on it, what are some of the narratives and practices that you think have been most critical for shaping and fostering Christian nationalism as an ideology? And how, how, does, how does, again, kind of, again, how does uh, MLK in particular challenge that with some of his specific practices? Yeah, well, so, you know, it gets into some pretty deep sociological questions about how this happened. And I think it is, I think there's lots of layers to it. Like 
what you know i grew up in evangelical christian circles you know i think even things like if you grew up uh reading the left behind series or even going back to this 70s earlier than that there's the the evangelical fascination with the apocalypse and it sort of created this culture of us of assuming that there is a cons an anti-christian conspiracy out there that everything we're doing is part of a global spiritual battle not just on an individual basis but as a as a on a national basis and and so you have that and then you there's almost this the christian subculture would would find these bogeymen that would just you you'd pluck out and and there might be real injustice there so you know talking about abortion laws something like that which from a christian a traditional christian perspective is an injustice but then it gets magnified to where it's it's not just a disagreement about legal rights it's part of a global cabal that seeks to sacrifice children and then it seeks to uh uh, torture children and sexually abuse children, and then it go and it just goes and goes and goes. So, so what I would say is, and I know I mentioned President Trump a few times. President Trump was an accelerant. He was not the origin. It's like the, the Christian subculture, at least segments of that, was already hardwired for something like this. Whether it's you know, you know, Obama not being born in this country. Hillary Clinton being part of a child trafficking ring out of the basement of a pizza parlor. And, you know, and some of it gets more and more ludicrous, but it is a, it is a, it is being, in my view, for decades, becoming increasingly wired as a Christian subculture to view the dark world as a raid against us where it's good versus evil all the way down and that's that's a mindset where you you are just not primed for collaboration uh, across cultural boundaries you are primed for conspiracy so that, that's just one angle of it that that folks who are more cultural anthropologists and sociologists would know a lot more than i do but i just think it's it's fascinating how this has gone from the 70s 80s 90s up to today where you just you know you watch some of the videos of christian pastors you know, some of you might have seen the video right before the or after the election of the Christian pastor in rural Minnesota who was talking about having his, you know, AR-15 ready to go because Antifa was about to invade his town and we had to stand up and impose martial law. So, I mean, it's just enough to make you wring your hands. So that was a long answer to just one aspect of it. <laughs> King King responds to all of that, I think, by saying. It's all about relationship. It's all about relationship, right? It's, you know, his his focus on civil rights was not, be, as we sometimes talk about it today, in an effort to uh, cre uh, maximize autonomy or independence or freedom for the sake of freedom. It was to restore the relationships that had been breached by subjugation and marginalization and discrimination and segregation. It's all about relationships. And that, I mean, that's, I think, for Christians, what it is. That's why we believe in the Trinity, right? Eternal God has always been all about relationship. That's, that was the big distinctive of Christianity. It's a God who is inescapably relational. And that's what King emphasized. Thank you, Dean Risher. All right, I'm going to open it up for, I have more questions, but I'm going to open it up for other questions here. Uh, Seth, would you like to go ahead and pose your question? Yeah, so Dean Vischer, one thing I was curious about is beyond just like articulating a theology and understanding the kind of broken theology of Christian nationalism, how do you respond to the psychological appeal of it? Like why do you, you know, like why people want to believe it in the first place? Because I think just day-to-day -day life, I think that's almost the question I try to, I think a lot of us too, it's like, that's the one where we're like, crap, what do I do about that beyond just, you know, obviously yeah. the things you just talked about. It's a great question. And, and to be clear, I don't have the answers to this, but I have a perspective. So take it for whatever, whatever it's worth. I, I do think there is something appealing about the mindset of Christian 
nationalism because it is um, it, is, it is imposing clear moral order on a world that seems chaotic, right? We, we, there's something that really appeals to us where we could clearly say, oh, good guys, bad guys, okay? It's not fuzzy, no shades of gray. You, you, you talk to Christian nationalists, there are no shades of gray. It's, you're either on the side of truth and light or you are in the darkness. It, it also imposes order in this sense, not just good versus evil, but a, a narrative of order. So especially looking at the past year with the pandemic, with racial unrest, with the polarization leading to the election, all these things. And instead of saying, you know what, it's possible that our lives were upended because a new virus came out of an animal market in China and spread around the world. That's pretty scary because it makes existence seem very out of control and chaotic, as opposed to saying, you know, whatever version you want to take, the whole thing is a hoax. China deliberately planted in it with us. Bill Gates planted it. You know, uh, Fauci is in cahoots with whatever. Now the microchip and the vaccine or whatever, it, wherever you want to take it, it's, it's all about imposing order on a chaotic world. And so I, the appeal of a conspiratorial mindset, which is central to Christian nationalism as well, it helps us feel in control again, because it's not just looking out at a random you know, assortment of events that were left to deal with the out with the fallout from. It is a concerted plot by evildoers that we have to stand up against, just as the Bible predicted. So I think a lot of it is just this desire for order, which I'm sympathetic to, but it's not it's not really how life works. I'm gonna call on uh, Abdul Latif. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I was late. Uh, I was really looking forward to this talk. Um, and you may have already covered this, um, but I was wondering what you had to say about the role of social media um, in this. Maybe you already talked about this, but uh, what do you think? Yeah, no, I didn't talk about it. And again, there's some, there's a growing number of really great resources out there about the effect of social media. And some of you know a lot be better than I do just how our brain chemistry functions. And um, we, you know, it's, it's, it's partly the addiction to outrage. And it's partly having the, you know, I think we're actually less polarized in reality than one would perceive from social media but it can become a prophecy that brings itself into reality because if you spend all day on a highly polarized platform, you're gonna to tend to be more polarized. So I do, and I don't have, I definitely don't have the answers to this, but it makes it, it, makes it much harder. And I, and I would say that the, it's, it's not just social media, it's, it's all, not all, but, even the flagship media enterprises are feeding into this because it's all a competition for eyeballs, which is in a large part a function of our brain chemistry. And so, you know, I, I mean, you, folks on the right side of the spectrum who say, well, look what has happened to CNN over the years, they're right. CNN has gone more in the direction of trafficking and outrage from one side of the spectrum and uh, just as Fox News has done on the other side and MSNBC and everybody is picking a side. And uh, there's a great book that I would recognize uh, that I'd recommend by uh, Ezra Klein called Why We're Polarized. And he gets into the social media side of this a bunch and he even talks about um, why polarization, he says polarization is catnip for brands, right? So even Nike's decision to uh, to secure Colin Kaepernick as its spokesperson. Traditionally, you would say, oh, a big corporation is going to want to stay away from anything controversial. And not at all, because they know that sort of firing up their base of consumers who really believe and support Colin Kaepernick 
will outweigh any losses they have from folks who don't support Colin Kaepernick. And you just play that out across the media landscape, across the corporate landscape, is there something about the human mind that makes the outrage and the polarization really good for business, uh, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is. And I don't, I don't know what to do with it, but it's a problem because it's, even if individuals are trying to build bridges one-to-one, -one, we've got these larger forces, not because they're evil or they're trying to sow chaos, because they're trying to make money. And that's a good way to make money is through polarization. Thank you, Dean Bisher. Um, I think we have a question from Andrew Hansen. Andrew, would you like to pose your question? Yeah, I'd be glad to. First, thanks so much, Dean Bisher, for, for the talk. Um, my question is if, if Perry and Whitehead in particular address uh, sort of what's new about Christian nationalism or if it's new or how far back in American history this goes, because I'm struck by that, you know, some of the elements of this at least sort of like a providential understanding of America and God's plan, um, you know, go back at least to the to the 19th century. And so I'm curious, are there kind of particularly new elements to it that we see emerging in the 21st century? Um, or if it's not new, does it seem like it's actually on the on the increase or on the decline? It, it's a good question. They don't get into this. Um, I do think, I mean, some of it that is new is just what Abdul's question was getting to is, you know, we we don't <clears throat> we don't have three evening news anchors deciding what Americans need to hear every evening on the news. It's a full blown marketplace where people are competing for eyeballs. So it's just an accelerant for all of this. But it's but it's not new in the basics. Like if you, I mean, Billy Graham got his launch because William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper publisher, liked that Graham was anti-communist. And so he instructed his newspapers, we've got to play up Billy Graham because he's going to be a good anti-communist crusader. So let's give him visibility and notoriety through, his, I mean, so that was, and you saw that a lot in the 50s. I mean, the whole adding under God to the Pledge of Allegiance, it was, we need to uh, leverage Christian beliefs in our nation as part of the national identity to combat communism, right? That's, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but that's also connected to Christian nationalism because it's this fusion of Christian identity and religious identity. So I think that was big in the 50s. You know, you, you probably can go back and look anytime there's a big threat, the pressure to merge those is greater. And so today, the threat is, I mean, there's several of them from this worldview, the threat is immigration, the threat is Muslim extremism, the threat is uh, LG, LGBTQ uh, rights that are going to encroach on Christian institutional autonomy, the threat is, you know, socialism taking root. I mean, so it's this threat and then, okay, we've got to remember America and Christianity go together, we have a special call and then it just takes off from there. It's just, in my view, much more explosive now because of social media and technology and they know how to really connect people. And I mean, you've all seen this probably in your circles. It's even with your extended families, it's, it's just a, it's a super challenge that I'm not sure how to sort through. Travis? I'm gonna make my comments quick because my kids are crying in the background. But uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Dean Fisher. Um, I have so many questions. One, one has to do with King's um, understanding of America, um, and you know, I guess it's a question about, um, you know, what did he see as sort of the American ideal, and in a sense, was it God's will? Um, I mean, I'm thinking about like democracy. Was democracy God's will, um, according to King? And if so, how do we sort of distinguish that sort of vision, theological vision of America from Christian nationalism? Yeah, that's good. I mean, the skeptic will say, well, K 
King also, you know, played into the myth of America. He just, you know, played into the myth uh, informed by the better angels uh, of America compared to some of what we've seen recently. And I don't, others might know better than me. I don't know that that King's political theology was all that well worked out, at least in my reading. So you might see snippets of that. I do think um, I do think he was less likely to feed into that mindset. So so at the time that King was coming up, there was a book uh, by uh, Gunnar Myrtle that was super influential that was kind of the enlightened liberal approach to race relations. And what Myrtle had said was race, racial justice is going to happen naturally as people educate themselves more and more and more. We just need to get the education out there, get the information out there, expose folks to it. And to me, that's more in keeping with, oh yeah, America is on this enlightened path of democracy. We just need to continue on that path. Um, King rejected that and he said, uh, no, uh, it doesn't work that way. It's, it, you know, the arc of the universe is long, but bends toward justice. But that didn't mean we could passively wait and sit back while it bends. We had to pull it. And so in in that case, in, in that sense, he was very much of the mindset, this is up to us. It's not simply a case of working out God's will, right? Like, um, I mean, so one one thing that's notable about Christian nationalism, they're not really saying we have to work for anything. They, they're just saying we need to preserve the path. Like we need to go back. We we had it. We had it good, right? I mean, the whole "Make America Great Again," which is, which also kind of captures a lot of Christian nationalism. The answer is behind us, which of course raises very hard questions from those who, you know, from women, from people of color and say, exactly when was America great? What what time period are we talking about that we're going back to now? This is getting uncomfortable. Um, so, so that's one of the differences, what the myth is. If the myth is America is capable of greatness, uh, the vision of white child and black child walking hand in hand, which King did talk about frequently, but it's up to us to work to get there. That's very different than, hey, God bestowed upon us a unique role in world history, and we are moving away from it. We just need to stop and go back and rest in that role. It's a, so part, this is a long, I haven't thought of this particular question, which is probably why I'm being long-winded. It's, is the myth excusing inaction? Or is the myth propelling our own efforts forward? I would say that would be a key distinction. I want to take a moment to get back to to, well, to to address a question that Dan Olson posed related to the church and to kind of um, get back to my question about formation a little bit. So it seems to me that some of this formation uh, for good and ill is happening in the church, right? Um, related to Christian nationalism or rejections of it. And, uh, you know, so I'm just trying to think, um, you know, the church is a is a community that is composed of every tribe, tongue, and nation. It, it, it kind of, uh, you know, transcends time and space and culture, um, but it's also deeply committed to declaring and embodying the way of Jesus in particular times and places and polities, right? And I think MLK did a great did a great job um, being kind of committed to the particular moment he was in. Um, so how do we how do we think about how do we think about questions related to like patriotism and nationalism in the church, and specifically how can we engage uh, kind of these these formative practices that can uh, sometimes be used to kind of nationalize our theological imagination and formation. So I don't know if that's super clear. Yeah, no, that's a huge question, and I welcome other thoughts on this too. I do think one very difficult dimension of this is it's 
it's hard for many pastors to lead on this because the last thing they want to do is alienate 40% of the congregation by pushing in one direction or the other. So I think for a lot of pastors, the answer is, we're not going to talk about immigration, right? We're, we're not going to talk about racial justice, not because they're opposed to it or that be, because it's, let's keep this kind of at the uh, traditional sermon level of our own spiritual development and stuff and not get into that really difficult territory that's going to end up with people walking out on me because there is a lot of people walking out uh, these days too. And so, and that's not to excuse it. I think we do need to tackle it, but I, I do think some of it realistically is going to take place either at sub pastor level within congregations or outside congregations completely, which is, you know, Anselm House and other things like this are really important because it's going to be, um, well, for me, what opportunities present themselves for me to develop deeper empathy for those outside my cultural bubble, right? Because So one, e one, not easy, but one obvious answer is, a lot of Christian nationalism is taken care of when Christians have a more global outlook, right? If you're an American Christian and you have uh, in-depth knowledge of what's happened to Christians in Iraq or in other countries around the world, you're much less likely to consider yourself persecuted, right? So that's one answer. You, so you're um, Christians in the developing world or Christians outside the United States do not understand Christian nationalism in America. Like, what are you even, what are you talking about? Right. Because they just don't have that national overlay. So part of this is how do we acquire a more global perspective in our understanding of the faith community? How do we understand how do we acquire a more cross-cultural perspective in our understanding of American Christianity? And this is where the church landscape suffers from some of the same reasons that social media does, is it's a marketplace. And too often we tend to be drawn to the place where, you know, we go for Sunday morning to be comforted and to have a comfortable experience. And a lot of times we go to be with people who look like us, who act like us, who vote like us, who live like us, because that's that's more comfortable for us. And then we just are going deeper and deeper into the bubble. So the formation side, I think, is figuring out in an active free market of church experiences, how do we create and promote opportunities to stretch ourselves cross-culturally as American Christians? Because I think once you do that, a lot of the Christian nationalist agenda just doesn't even resonate anymore. Thank you for that. Um, I think there's another question here, really just trying to get at, again, kind of, and maybe this could be even applied to the church, again, in particular, but, you know, are there good versions or virtuous versions of Christian nationalism? And I think you spoke to this a little bit, again, distinguishing between patriotism and, and nationalism. I guess maybe if I would add to this, uh, that question, yeah, so what's the difference between patriotism and nationalism? And what is the theological significance of nation states and specific political communities? So how, how can Christians care and pursue the, the welfare of our particular political communities and value those communities in relation to other political communities outside of our particular nation state and ultimately in relation to God? It's a great question, and, it, and it's another one where I, I don't even want to be perceived as, as purporting to be an expert on this. A couple of questions I would ask is, <clears throat> do I think that my relationship with my country as an American Christian should be different than a French Christian's relationship with France or a Nigerian Christian's relationship with the nation state of Nigeria down the road. If I do, I'm 
I'm heading for trouble. Second, um, am I purporting to know God's will or plan for my country as though it has some sort of unique role in God's plan? I'm not saying that God doesn't have plans for countries, but he hasn't told us what they are. And usually when we purport to know, we are projecting our own commitment to the primacy of our country as an overlay on God's plan for the universe. And that, you know, in a lot of this is we want to be basking in the reflected glory of our country being in a special role. If we're talking about love of country in the same way we would talk about love of place love of you know our community that's all healthy and good but that's also not relative like i'm not when i express love for my family i'm not saying my love for my family is different than your love for your family why i mean if somebody did say that you'd say you're you're crazy or you're you know deluded that doesn't even make sense but at the country level it happens it happens more frequently and i just think it's a dangerous place to be in if that makes sense thank you for that okay i think we have time for one last question do i have any people interested in posing one last question for dean visher well I joseph have, has a question oh go ahead go ahead i already asked the question so Joseph, right, so maybe we'll, well, maybe we'll let yeah we'll let Joe uh, pose his question. Joe, would you like to unmute yourself and pose your question directly? Sure, I can do that. Uh, Dean Fisher, thank you for being here. Um, I guess one one question I would have is like, what are healthy ways of engaging with friends and family who might be sympathetic to some of these ways of thinking, or might kind of, if not fully, have kind of somewhat bought into the, like Christian nationalist mentality um what are healthy ways of or how would king maybe um yeah have for us um, to engage with them so my my answer which might be a frustrating answer is just love them and prioritize the relationship not don't don't prioritize persuasion because persuasion is probably not going to work and i you know i've got in my extended family, I have folks pretty far on the left and I've got very hardcore Trump supporters. And what I've had to do is just say, what matters is the relationship. And uh, maybe by eventually learning to trust me, there's opportunities to speak into that, but that's not why I'm doing it. And so that means prioritizing the relationship is sometimes I'm not gonna talk about this. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean being silent in the face of injustice. It just means really choosing your spots. And I'll say one, one more thing on this, that, that there's been lots of studies in a cultural cognition movement, which is super interesting, run by some folks out of Yale. Uh, and one of the conclusions they've come to conclude without any hesitation is more information on most of these hot button issues, more information will not sway people. In fact, it may make them in, entrench themselves more in that view because our views on these issues are not primarily about cognitive decisions. It's about belonging, right? And so what, let's take climate change. Um, if you're if you're trying to convince somebody who and i'll just say because this is how it breaks down usually if you're talking to someone in a small town rural setting about climate change giving them more information about it is not going to help because for them what's important is that they align with those in their community on their views the cost to them of climate change being true and wreaking havoc in the environment in the coming decades it's much less immediate than the cost of stepping out of alignment with their community and their views on the issue. So it's what matters is who's saying what, not the information, and what does what you're saying present to them in terms of a threat to their sense of belonging, right? We want, we are such social creatures. We're more social creatures than we even admit to ourselves. We want to belong. And that's one reason why you see this 
great, you know, polarization based geographically, not just through social media. It's we want to belong with those around us. And one way we do that is with agreeing with them on core issues. And so I don't have good answers for how to persuade someone, but I think as a Christian and in keeping with King, I'm called to value the relationship more than I'm called to persuade them of the position that I believe is right. Well, Dean Vischer, thank you so much for these thoughtful responses and your thoughtful lecture as well. Thank you for being with us, um, everyone. It's great to, to have you for this conversation. Thank you for joining, and I uh, hope everybody has a, a wonderful afternoon. So please join me in thanking Dr. Vischer. Great. Thanks, everybody. It was a great, great time to be with you. Thanks for all your thoughtful questions. All right. Take care.